people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Shreya Savichai with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. In the face of a growing Chinese threat in the region, India and Sri Lanka have committed to deepen their defence ties. Indian Army Chief M.M. Naravne visited the island nation for four days and discussed the entire gamut of defence cooperation between the two sides. Observers believe that Colombo, which has titled in favour of Beijing until recent past, is now realising its devious agenda and is changing its strategies vis-à-vis -vis evolving global dynamics. India and Sri Lanka have resolved to bolster their defence cooperation. And it was evident in the four-day visit of the Indian Army Chief M. M. Naravne to the island nation. His visit, which came on the sidelines of annual joint military exercise between the two neighbours called Mitra Shakti, focused at developing an integrated defence mechanism against any form of aggression. Observers opine the biggest of them is China. Chinese leadership, which has close links with the Rajapaksa brothers, the leaders of the island nation, has been looking to tighten its grip on the country through its debt trap policy, especially after it secured the control over Sri Lanka's deep sea Hambantota port. India, on the other side, which has rendered its military and intel support to the island nation on several occasions in the past, have only looked to deepen its ties with its neighbour. Hence, the priority for Colombo becomes clear. It is India it can rely on. India and Sri Lanka have been able to help the country in the country of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka has been able to help Sri Lanka in the country of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka has been able to help Sri Lanka in the country of Sri Lanka in the country of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka's policy makers too have underlined time and again the urgency to enhance defence ties with India, especially in the face of an expanding Chinese footprint which many believe has the potential to severely undermine territorial integrity of the island nation in coming times. An integrated country strategy paper released last month by Colombo called for a comprehensive defence partnership with India. It asked for frequent joint military exercises, more high-level military exchanges, utilization of India's $50 million counter-terrorism line of credit and for increasing the staff strength of Defence Advisor's office. The bilateral ties between New Delhi and Colombo had hit a low after the government of Sri Lanka had unilaterally banished India and Japan from Colombo port's East Container Terminal, which the three were supposed to develop together. Experts say it could have been Chinese instructions at play. New Delhi, however, has maintained that both the countries should have strong defence ties. My visit also coincides with the ongoing India-Sri Lanka joint bilateral military exercise, Exercise Mitra Shakti, which is the largest bilateral exercise being undertaken between us. I shall be witnessing the culmination phase of this exercise along with General Silva. These exercises form a major part of India and Sri Lanka's growing defence relationship. A 
And while the trade between the two sides has grown significantly with time, it is the defence cooperation that needs a boost. Both Sri Lanka and India share a lot when it comes to their foes. The terrorism has severely affected both of them in past few years. An overly aggressive China is what they face now. While Beijing has used its coercive diplomacy to enter Sri Lanka, it has constantly, though unsuccessfully, been trying to alter the status quo along the border with India. Moving on, the same regional threat that has prompted the Sri Lankan government to enhance defence ties with India has also brought multiple countries together in containing China's unilateral and law-defying advancements in the Indo-Pacific. Recently, the Quad countries, the US, India, Japan and Australia held Malabar naval exercise in the Bay of Bengal with a message that all like-minded countries were working together to ensure a peaceful Indo-Pacific. In an event showcasing a clear deepening of ties between the court countries, the United States, India, Japan and Australia came together once again, this time through a naval exercise. The second phase of the premier level maritime Malabar exercise hosted by the United States in the Bay of Bengal included a variety of high-end tactical training, including specific interactions that are designed to enhance interoperability between the Royal Australian Navy, Indian Navy, Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force and the US Maritime Forces. This year's Malabar, which was held in two phases, first in August and the second now, have included maritime operations, anti-submarine warfare operations, air warfare operations, live fire gunnery events, replenishments at sea, cross-tech flight operations and maritime interdiction operations. Earlier phase was carried out in the Philippine Sea. The admirals of participant countries leading the planning and executing multinational exercises in two phases set. It allows them to operate in different situations and enhances their readiness for all eventualities. It's a red letter day as far as Malabar is concerned. We started in 1992. It's going to be nearly 30 years uh, that we've been doing Malabar and this is the 25th edition. Uh, we have uh, we started only as a bilateral but we moved along both in scope and complexity and today's uh, Malabar has the aircraft carrier uh, destroyers, we have four different navies, we've got a submarine, we've got maritime reconnaissance aircraft and uh, uh, we have over a period of time built uh, interoperability, uh, trust, understanding and uh, that is what uh, the navies are all about so that when we have to meet a common challenge. Observers say that exercises like Malabar act as major deterrent to Beijing, which has been consistently trying to dominate the region at all fronts, whether related to trade or defence. While stressing that India was one of the key strategic partners of the United States, US Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Mike Gildes said that the relationship between the two was a stronghold of a free and open Indo-Pacific. The intent is to operate side by side with like-minded navies, right? Like-minded democracies, uh, like-minded nations who want to keep uh, keep those uh, those trade routes free and open, as I mentioned before. That's the real power of our out here uh, operating on a day-to-day -day basis in the Bay of Bengal. We're not pointed towards China. We're uh, we're, we're we're focused on being more interoperable together to maintain those free and open maritime commerce. In 2020, the Quad navies had also carried out exercises in the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal. The Quad formation, four of the strongest democracies around the world, have time and again emphasized on rules-based global order, which many experts on the subject feel has been defied by China. The key issue of a free Indo-Pacific had also resonated at the first in-person leadership summit 
held a few days back in the United States. And these developments have apparently rattled China, which has accused the grouping of targeting it. While sometimes it has called the grouping super flares, on other occasion it has tried to undermine it through its state media. The message, however, from Quad is simple and clear. Live and let live. Do not create troubles for others if you want your backyard to be peaceful. Moving on. With each rising sun, the Afghan misery is multiplying. The Taliban, which has blatantly disregarded the components of the peace deal, has also failed at all fronts in providing even a basic lifestyle to common Afghans. Unemployment rate is growing sharply and in the absence of job opportunities, people are forced to abandon their homes. The aid which Kabul has received so far has not just been enough. And despite all this, the new establishment is firm on its range of stances, including restrictions on women, to imposition of archaic religious laws, which are not just impeding the common Afghan lives, but put a colossal barrier in front of a water nation. The Taliban is relishing power. It is holding meetings with its close Islamic allies, apparently discussing the future of Afghanistan, the country in which the Human Rights Index has nosedived in the past few weeks. People are dying of violence and hunger. But the question is, do the Taliban care? The turn of events in past weeks suggests a clear no. If it wasn't for aid agencies that have delivered food, blankets and cash to hundreds of displaced families in Kabul as humanitarian assistance, thousands more would have perished. But even the assistance has an expiry date and limit. There are countries which are reluctant to release funds, for they are still unconvinced by Taliban's shallow arguments that it is going to work in the welfare of common Afghans. And those on ground are overwhelmed with the consistently growing numbers of displaced Afghans. Basically what we do uh, in communities is that we conduct assessments to identify the needs uh, of displaced persons but also the needs of local communities. Then those needs are met through distributions of non-food items and food items like the ones you, you are seeing today. Uh, the assessments that we are conducting are continuous. The assistance to the Afghan people, especially those displaced and those returning from neighboring countries. As winter approaches, the need for assistance has grown even more. With many having fled from the provinces and sleeping in tents or improvised accommodation around the city, the coming days could prove fatal. Displaced people have expressed that they are temporarily satisfied with what they are receiving, but also demanded more in the face of approaching winters. Farmers and rural people displaced by drought, poverty has extended into the cities where widespread unemployment has forced many to try to sell their household goods to raise money. Going by the projections of international organizations, the number of displaced is going to witness an unprecedented rise in coming times. Many fear, in absence of jobs and cash, the economy, which is hanging at the brink of survival, is poised to collapse. UN estimates suggest that as much as 97% of the country's population could be plunged into poverty by next year in a worst-case scenario.
Many groupings, including the G20, have been deliberating over the situation and have pledged to support Afghans. But the major question which arises here and will continue to stand firm is if the Taliban is going to mend its mode of operation. For it has refused to give ground on allowing girls to return to high school, one of the key demands of the international community after a decision last month that schools above the sixth grade would only reopen for boys. Reprisal attacks, freedom of speech and basic human rights are other issues that the group running the government hasn't so far come up with any answers. And now in our section of Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent that hit the headlines this week. Japanese silver grass is a landscape symbol during autumn in Japan. It is the landfill oversight of Yatozawa disposable site in Hinode town of Tokyo and now the original scenery is full of nature. It is home to many precious creatures and insects. Tokyo Metropolitan Government is responsible for thorough management and preservation of the regenerated natural environment. It used to be a landfill for incinerated ash and waste from nearby municipalities. え、里山的自然環境の再現というのがございます。え、希少な生き物たち、え、国鳥と呼ばれる大紫っていうのがございますが、それらをはじめ、水辺を好む A sports ground will be built in the area for the citizens. The Futat Suzuka disposal site is a managed final disposal site equipped with the highest level of facility and system in Japan and carries out thorough safety management. Natural destruction caused by landfill construction and soil pollution in waste disposal plants have become major problems in the world. The Tokyo Metropolitan Government's Eco Cement Project contributes to recycling society and conservation of nature through the reuse of incineration ash. Casio's popular watch company G-Shock has released a new watch that incorporates the trends of the times. It syncs up with the world's trend of gender-free. This is an early type of G-Shock, a best-selling watch that has made G-Shock's name known all over the world. This type is designed to change this early type of G-Shock to a metal-covered timepiece. Both watches have a different atmosphere from the traditional wild G-Shock design. G-Shock Casio's business strategy is a hit because it manufactured products that match the trends of the times. Casio's watch is popular all over the world because of their unique design and tough high-quality products. North Korean state media recently released a video showing the country's leader Kim Jong-un watching an extreme martial arts demonstration by soldiers at a military event marking the 76th founding anniversary of its ruling party. The video was aired by North Korea's state-run television KRT. Soldiers performed multiple shows of strength, smashing items, breaking free from chains, lying on glass and throwing knives. 
Kim smiled and clapped as he watched the show at the Defense Development Exhibition Self Defense 2021. During the exhibition, Kim said his country's weapons development is necessary in the face of hostile policies from the United States and a military buildup in South Korea, according to state media. Moving on, the magnificence and diversity of Indian culture is reflected in its festivals. Every Indian celebrates festivals with enthusiasm and devotion. It is an expressive way to celebrate the glorious heritage, culture, and traditions of the country. And today, in our episode of South Asia Focus, we'll show you the colors of one of the biggest festivals, Durga Puja, that was celebrated recently with great fervor. And the core reason behind the celebration remains the same, like the Shehra, that is victory of good over evil. Take a glance. The Indian festival season has ushered in, starting from Navratri to Dashera to Diwali. India is on a string of festivals. Durga Puja is one such festival that was celebrated in the country with great zeal and enthusiasm. While Navratri is a nine-day festival dedicated to Goddess Durga and her various incarnations, Durga Puja is celebrated in eastern parts of India for the last five days of Navratri. Durga Puja marks the victory of Goddess Durga over the evil buffalo demon king Mahishasu. Devotees offered prayers at temples and visited markets on this special occasion. Some women also perform Dunuchi dance or Aarti to thank Goddess Durga. There are several parts of the Durga Puja culture. One is Dhunuchi. Dhunuchi was not initially a dance form. It's a basically a part of the Aradhana or Puja. Like we use Shankha, we use Pradeep, we use Panch Pradeep and Dhunuchi is like that only. Uh, like dhup, uh, counterpart of dhup. And then there is a dhak. And dhak, you know, it creates a rhythmic beat. And it, any rhythmic beat, it's a part of human psychology. Durga Puja is a five day extravaganza and consists of stunning idols, brightly lit pandals, loud music, maha aarti, and much more. This year too, pandals of Goddess Durga with different themes were erected across Indian states. During the festival, devotees wear new traditional colourful clothes, chant hymns in the temples, distribute sweets and some even observe fast to show gratitude to Goddess Durga. They believe that by controlling physical needs like hunger, a person can gain spirituality and that fasting helps in creating harmony between the body and soul. On the day of Ashtami, devotees worship the goddess Mahagori. The eight incarnation of goddess Durga is considered auspicious. Our Raju, today Ashtami ka day, Navratri ka Ashtami me eight Kumari ka pujan ho gaya. Sab kuch bohot achha se chal raha hai, mata ka puja chal raha hai, sadhar log aake maa ko darshan kar rahe hain. Durga Puja is the main festival in West Bengal state and various cities of India like Kohati, Varanasi mark the last day with Sindur Khela, the last day of the celebrations before the immersion of Goddess Durga idols in the water bodies. It is believed that during the festival, Goddess Durga descends on earth to destroy the demons and bless our devotees with happiness and prosperity. Durga Puja is celebrated with grandeur by Hindus throughout the country and is one of the most important religious festivals of India. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.